Great. So uh, my lecture, as uh, like I said, is on random field theory and some other alternatives that we can use. Um, this talk fits in really at the end of a lot of other things that you've learned about. So you've learned about how to sort of do pre-processing, how to do smoothing, how to construct a model uh, and come up with contrasts that interrogate that model. Um, but after the, the, the smoke clears, and this can be whether you're doing PET, uh, fMRI at the first level, fMRI at the second level, um, really EG, anything, you're going to get to the point where you have a statistic map and you need to decide where is there an effect and where is there not. That could be in a, a single subject looking at the, uh, is there a difference between the, the baseline and the active condition, or it could be comparing, comparing groups. Uh, doesn't matter. The question is basically generic. Where is there something real in the data? And so the, that's the purpose of this lecture, is that no matter where you're coming from, when you need to figure out what's junk and what's real, you need to use the tools that you have in your life. So the first thing we have to ask ourselves is, given that we have an image of statistics, uh, how do we sort of find some, how do we describe the stuff that's in there? Now, the simplest approach to this would simply just say, well, let's just uh, apply a threshold. So if we apply a very high threshold, we won't get very much, but we should be able to trust that, right? I mean, we could use a very, very low threshold, and that would be very sensitive. We won't miss, we'll have good uh, power, but low specificity, because we'll get a lot of stuff that maybe we can't trust. So the thing I'd like to actually uh, ask, though, and try to broaden your mind is to think, well, why threshold in the first place at all? Is there some other way we can look at this? And if you were just a Martian that landed down and had to sort of step in and start to think about modeling brain image data, they might take an approach like this. Don't threshold, but actually explicitly model the structure that you anticipate in the image data and parameterize it in terms of meaningful uh, quantities that you would like to make inference on. So, for example, if we'd like to learn where is there a location of, a, of an activation, we, of course, like to get estimates and measures of uncertainty of those, those locations. Uh, but like to know what the magnitude is of that, uh, of that activation. And I might want to know what is the spatial extent. Um, and in both cases, we'll want more confidence intervals, and measures of uncertainty, and hopefully defined in some robust way. Well, that's what we'd like, but actually we don't really get much of that at all. This requires an explicit spatial model. But of course, in the context of, of SPM and basically all other sort of standard uh, processing packages for, for MRI, uh, is a mass univariate approach where we fit a model at each point in the brain. So we only have a mass univariate model, not a spatial model. So what do we get in practice? Well, for signal location, you know, those X, Y, Z coordinates on the results page, nothing. We get no measures of uncertainty. If I were to repeat my experiment with another 20 subjects, how much would those peaks move around? can't tell you. We do not have spatial measures of uncertainty on the local maximum. Signal magnitude? Well, because we're taking a mass univariate approach where we fit a linear model at each point in the brain, there we can get pretty much everything you want, all the usual results from a statistical procedure, confidence intervals, p-values, estimates, whatever you need. Spatial extent is actually somewhere in between where, uh, sure, we get a volume for you know, your particular cluster, uh, and we can compute a p-value. How surprising is that to define the cluster of that size, given that there would be no signal anywhere, but we get no confidence intervals because we don't have a spatial model to say, okay, I got a thousand cluster, thousand voxel cluster on this data set. If I repeat my experiment again and again and again, am I get, going to get anywhere from 50 to 10,000 or is it just going to be like, uh, you know, 990 to 1,010? Uh, we don't have that, those measures of uncertainty because we don't have a spatial model. And what's more, of course, cluster inference is sensitive to the, the blob defining threshold. So that, now that I've kind of raised your expectations and lowered them back down, what do we practically get? We don't get inference on location. We just get uh, p-values on, 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 on peaks, and we could get confidence intervals if we could visualize them, and just p-values on the extent. So let's walk through these, the different ways we have of assessing statistic images and brain imaging. 
So the, 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 the standard sort of go-to way I say is thresholding, and that gives us voxel level inference. So we pick a threshold and we declare everything above, uh, every voxel that has a value above that threshold to be statistically significant. So this is good, it's very specific. It tells us which voxels are significant. We can point to individual voxels and say these are significant, and anything that isn't above the threshold, we say it's not significant. So that's, that's very good and easy to interpret. However, it generally is not as sensitive uh, in practice as cluster level inference. So cluster level inference is a two-step process. So we define clusters by an arbitrary threshold, U cluster, and that gives us a, uh, a size or volume of, of each cluster. Now in this one dimensional example, the size is just the length right here. And then we assess significance on the basis of the size, in this case, the length, and here we'd say, yeah, no, that, that, that size of that cluster is not surprisingly large. We would not mark that as significant. This cluster is surprisingly large. We mark that as significant. But the downside to cluster inference is that it generally has less spatial specificity because we are rejecting the cluster null hypothesis. So we're not pointing to individual voxels in here and saying, oh, there must be something at that voxel. We're just saying that there is something somewhere in this, uh, in this, this cluster. So uh, that's that's a trade-off. Generally more sensitive, but you have less spatial specificity. And if you look on the SPM results page over in the far left, you'll also see a column for set level inference. And this is really the most simple assessment of the, the, the image. And that is simply saying for a given threshold, how many blobs are there that are above a minimum blob size of whatever you set? Could be zero, could be you know, some number of boxes. And that is a test statistic, which you can then come up with a p-value. So here I could say how many clusters were larger than k, one, and then I can get a p-value. So this, this one, it does not have any spatial specificity. It is a global thing. Can I reject the global null hypothesis or not? That's what that tells you. So not so interesting, but does give you an overall assessment of the experiment. Did this work? Are there any differences? Okay. So. Notice I didn't really talk about how we find p-values or, or anything. That's just the ways that you can assess statistic images. But now we have to, when we want to assign the p-values, we have to deal with the multiple testing. So p-values, hopefully you've all had basic statistic classes, knowing that the p-values are a standardized way to express the evidence against the null hypothesis. You either can think of this as a, uh, we set some level uh, alpha, and if the test statistic comes above that level, uh, that, that threshold that's given by, by, by mu alpha, then we can say we reject the null hypothesis and we know that we are controlling the false positive rate at alpha. Alternatively, you can get a p-value, which is the, 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 the probability of getting a result as a larger um, than is actually observed. Uh, and that is a continuous quantity that you can then compare to the level threshold alpha. Quick reminder that unless you are a Bayesian, the p-value is not the probability that the null hypothesis is true. We compute a p-value by starting by assuming that the null hypothesis is true, and then we do some calculations. So you can't start by assuming the null hypothesis is true, do some calculations, and arrive at the conclusion that the null hypothesis is true. That's, that, that's circular. Uh, so no, no, the p-value is the consistency between the data and the null hypothesis. And if it's very small, that's saying that the data are very inconsistent. Okay, workhorse of science, hypothesis testing. However, we are in the setting where we don't just do one hypothesis test, we do thousands of them. In particular, if you have a 100,000 hypothesis tests and you use a usual 0.05 uh, th uh, threshold, a p-value threshold, on average, you're going to get 5,000 false positives. This is the multiple comparison or the multiple testing problem. It is clearly evident that we have that at the voxel level, but we also have it at the cluster level. Now, every time you look at a different data set, there's going to be different numbers of clusters. That's a random quantity, but it's still the same problem. So if I have 100 clusters, which of these are significant? If I naively did an uncorrected measure, I would, if there were 100, I would get five false positives uh, in, in, on average. So we have to deal with this and address this. So it turns out that there are multiple ways of assessing false positive risk in the multiple testing setting. There's no one unique way to do it. Uh, there are actually multiple. So we'll start by talking about the, the perhaps the most narrow and, and precise way of talking about false positive risk uh, 
in the multiple testing setting, and that is the family-wise error rate. A family-wise error is the existence of any or one or more false positives, and the family-wise error rate is the probability of that error, of, of one or more false positives. So you probably have heard of Bonferroni. So Bonferroni is, uh, is not sort of a, the only method out there. Bonferroni is simply one way to control the family-wise error rate and uses some simple sort of inequalities to show that uh, that the that the family-wise error rate is bounded uh, under 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 absolutely no assumptions by the the sum of the, the the alpha levels used for each test in other words if you use a nominal alpha level divided by the number of tests you will have a valid procedure so again bonferroni is you take 0.05 you divide by the number of tests, and that will protect you uh, against inflated false positive risk in the sense of the family-wise error rate. Now, the problem we have here in brain imaging is 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 uh, can be found by can be seen by a little thought experiment. Imagine taking your brain image data and convolving it with a Gaussian kernel with full tap maximum size of one meter. How much information is in your data? How many independent pieces of information are in there? I would argue there's essentially probably just one value. When you, if you used a kernel that big, you probably have a single value over all of your 100,000 voxels in your image, and you no longer have a multiple testing problem because all the values are equal to each other. But if you were to use Bonferroni, Bonferroni would tell you to take 0.05 and divide by 100,000 to protect for, against all those tests. So this is just illustrating that Bonferroni cannot adapt to the degree of smoothness in your data. And that's why we reach to random field theory. So random field theory is uh, some really beautiful mathematics that was developed for uh, random processes. And uh, it, it, they, they do exist you know, in sort of a continuous theoretical land. Um, and we use them to the extent that images on the voxel lattice behave like continuous random processes. And if that's so, we actually can get some cool results. Now, of course, it's not important that you understand all the math behind it, but I think it's, it's nice to get a little bit of intuition about where these things are coming from. Uh, there's something called the Euler characteristic. It's just a property of a binary set in space, and it counts the number of blobs in minus the number of holes. So you can see here for a, for a statistic image, so this is basically your next failed experiment. This image is completely null. There's nothing going on here. So if you threshold it low, you'll see a big islands with some sort of, sort of uh, lakes in them. So we'd have to subtract these. But the main point is, and matches intuition, for a sufficiently high threshold, eventually you just get the peaks. There are no holes. And eventually you get to the point where you're just below the top peak and then above it, and it's you miss everything. So basically, the, the Euler characteristic is going to be some, somewhere between zero for super high thresholds, eventually becomes one, and then oops, and then eventually it come, picks up these uh, two or three, and it counts the number of blobs until if it's too low, it stops doing that. So why is this useful? Well, the family-wise error rate is the probability of getting one or more blobs when there's nothing going on. That's what's going on here. And so what is the event of getting one or more blobs? Well, that's the event of the Euler characteristic being greater than or equal to one, assuming we're up in this domain here. And then that can be approximated by the expected value, which actually works as long as we're up in this domain, where there's almost no, where we only see zero or one. So and why would we go to reach out to all this, this fancy mathematical theory? Well, it turns out it's really simple to apply. There's no Monte Carlo simulations. There's no, uh, it's all very simple for this form. If you know the size of your search region, how big is a brain, and how rough is the noise, you can turn the crank on this expression and we can find out what is the family-wise error risk for a given threshold U. And we can tune it and we can adjust it to find out what is the, the threshold that will give us 5%. So of course it does have some assumptions. We have to assume that data are multivariate or more normal. For the cluster size results, we need to assume that the smoothness is the same everywhere. That's a technical condition known as stationarity and also reflected in sufficient smoothness. And that has to do with the autocorrelation function uh, being smooth at the origin twice, twice different. Uh, so it's, it's a cute, it's, a, it's an amazing set of results. Um, but they are approximate, and, and also, 
this this whole expression here doesn't work for all thresholds U. The thing is, it only works when we have that high end where we just the oil characteristic is just zero one. And when it is in that condition, it does a very nice job of approximating uh, the Fellman-Wise error rate, and we can then get corrected p-values that reflect the evidence for an effect uh, accounting for the search of your space. Uh, there, of course, there's all there's more math that goes behind it. Uh, one of the contributions that Keith Worsley made, aside from sort of developing all this theory and translating it from sort of, sort of uh, deepest uh, uh, theoretical geometry, is to express this this uh, roughness term in a much more useful term, in a much more useful way, in terms of the full width half maximum of a Gaussian kernel that you need to smooth random noise so that it looks like the noise in your data. So I'll say that again. This is a little parameter down at the bottom of your uh, of your uh, SPM output that always tells you the full width half max. And what that is, it's the full width half maximum of a Gaussian kernel needed to smooth random independent noise to look like the noise in your data. And that's a very useful operational uh, uh, perspective, and uh, and it's a simple transformation. So the other thing you'll find at the bottom of your results. Uh, it's something called a result count. And again, another contribution from Keith Worsley to say, okay, well, actually, is there everyone wants some an effective number of n? And there, there is an effective number of voxels. There's no easy way to actually come at that, but there is something that's sort of like that, and that is how many full width half maximum sized voxels could you fit into your brain? And that's the result count. So here in, in one dimension. If I have a 10 voxel image and my full depth maximum is 2.5, I could fit in four resils into my image. So this is just uh, usually, we cannot use a resil count in a bonferroni like correction, but it's still a useful thing. And it's useful to look at and get intuition on because if, if your corrected p values are ever looking really wild and goofy, you can look at the full depth maximum and the resil count and see, are these like I usually see, or is there something really weird here? Are they very far? Okay, and then just to, to, to one more detail to, that's worth including is that so the, the random filter is really neat and beautiful because it only depends on the volume of the search region and how rough or smooth is the noise. But the question is, how do we estimate that smoothness? It is not just taken from the applied smoothness. If you use a six millimeter full tap maximum kernel, the smoothness is not six because it's the the applied smoothness plus all the intrinsic smoothness that's in there due to the image processing, the imperfect uh, uh, smoothness, imperfect uh, resolution of the imaging device. So we actually have to estimate it from the data. Of course, not the data itself, but from the noise. And our estimated noise are the residuals, the data minus the signal. So it's the standardized residuals that are actually used to estimate this. If you look inside your SPM results directory, you will see there's something called an rpv.nii uh, or rpv.image. That is the resils per voxel. Very hard to figure out what that is, but if you use image calculator to do this transformation, you will get a full tap maximum image, and that is the geometric mean of the full tap maximum of your smoothness of your noise at each voxels uh, in, in, in units of voxel. And that's kind of cool. So if there's again, if there's anything goofy going on in your, your, your results, you can actually make an image of full tap maximum smoothness and see what that looks like. In general, for, for fMRI, it's pretty homogeneous. VBM, there tends to be a lot of variation in the, the smoothness uh, of the data. Okay, so now this is where this is much more fun interactively, but I'll still sort of walk, this, uh, walk us through this. Um, it's useful to get some intuition that the corrected p-values actually have this expression here. So the corrected, the corrected p-value from random field theory is really actually nothing but the how big is the image, how rough it is times the particular threshold that we're using. So we can ask the question, okay, all things equal, as that threshold or a particular statistic value gets bigger and bigger, what happens to the corrected p-value? Well, it appears twice here, but uh, some math will tell you that the expo exponential term will dominate. So as t gets bigger and bigger and bigger, exponential minus t squared dominates, and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Make sense? So a bigger t value means a smaller corrected p value, all things equal. Yeah, that makes sense, right? Bigger statistical evidence against an hypothesis, smaller p value. Check. Now, all things equal, as the volume increases, so that's this term here, the lambda omega, all things equal, 
as lambda gets bigger, the corrected p-values are also going to get bigger. Does that make sense? So it's a not quite a natural thing because usually we don't change the brain volume, but certainly if you can imagine going from a small subvolume to larger, 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 the larger, the more brain you search over, the greater risk, all things being equal, of a false positive occurring. You have more opportunities to mistakenly think that something is going on. So this does make sense. All things equal, the larger volume you're searching over, the more we have to penalize the significance of any one given T value and indeed the corrected p-values will get bigger. And then the other one, let's see, all things equal as smoothness increases so that that lambda term gets smaller, it's reference uh, decreases, what happens? Well, all things equal that this thing gets smaller and so the p-values decrease. So that makes sense. So for the same t-value, all things equal, if the image was smoother and smoother, but you got the same t-value, you would get a smaller corrected p-value. And I would argue that also makes sense because the greater the smoothness, somehow fewer independent things in the image, less of a multiple testing problem. So hopefully that makes sense. And this is all of the reasons why we use random field theory. It is adapting to both the volume, as Bonferroni does with the, the voxel account, but crucially the smoothness. So as the smoothness increases, you're going to have less of a multiple testing and you'll have a, uh, a stronger p-value for a given t-value. So it's, this is why we use random field theory, because this is so handy and it adapts to the degree of smoothness dependence in the image. All right, the other reason why we use this is that it's a very general uh, uh, set of uh, uh, results that we can use with t-images, uh, chi-squared images, f-images. It's all, it's all very handy um, and very cute. I'll say less about cluster size inference, but it's all based on the same theory. We can use the properties of random fields for different smoothnesses for a given threshold. And in particular, you can see here for a given threshold on your next null experiment, the average proportion of voxels that go above the threshold is going to be the same, but the, the their arrangement will be different depending on the smoothness. And in particular, for larger smoothness, you expect to get fewer blobs for which each of them have a larger volume. Whereas if you have less smoothness, you expect to get more blobs, each of which have smaller volume. So math aside, just that the what's happening is that the random field theory can account for this and uses this, this, these relationships to give you a p-value to say, given that I found a cluster of a certain size, how surprising is that as measured by the p -value. And and further, we can also then correct that for searching over the brain. Uh, with, with a uh, correction for, for that gives us family-wise error control. So again, just summary, summary of the random field theory results. Uh, we, we do have to assume that the, there is sufficient smoothness because the, the, the discrete voxel or uh, uh, mesh data that we have has to behave like a smooth random process. We don't. We cannot just assume the smoothness. We have to estimate it from the residuals. And uh, the no normality, that's very hard to check. We just basically have to assume that that's correct. And there are a bunch of approximations in there. And for the cluster size difference, really, we have to be careful about using them with with a PBM. But they're okay ish for fMRI. So let's put this to work on a real uh, data set. Uh, this is a very old data set with only 12 subjects, but it makes a point. So uh, that the data can be summarized at, at, for each subject as basically a difference image or a contrast of the, the, the active and the rest of the condition. The active condition is a presented a list of three letters. And then after a pause, you're given a probe letter and you have to indicate was that a probe as part of the, the original target set. And the reference case is just you're showing X's and you have to say uh, yes or no. Because uh, I think it shows X or Y and you have to say yeah, was, that, um, was that X or, or Y. Okay, so we combine those with a one sample t-test and then we'll put them to work with random field theory. So there are about 100,000 voxels in this, this mask uh, and the smoothness is five by five, by about six by seven, both the maximum. And random field theory tells us that we should be using a threshold of 9.87. Now, you might look at this and say, oh, that's not really very impressive, is it? Well, A, there's only 12 subjects here. And also do not forget, we are controlling the family-wise error. This is saying 
we are 95% certain that there are no false positives anywhere. That's one way of expressing a family-wise error result. So this is a very precise uh, statement. It's a voxel-wise inference. So we can be very sure about these findings. And what can be done is you can say, I, I got one voxel here, and you might say maybe lower the threshold to, to illustrate where this is, if it's hard to find, as long as you're very clear about what you're doing there. Um, but indeed, it's not that that's it. So maybe we, there's some things we can do to address that lack of sensitivity, but certainly very trustworthy results, just not very sensitive. Uh, well, one thing that we, we we found that we looked at with evaluations is that there are definitely the things you want to know that, that when you're using a uh, cluster-wise inference, uh, to, to make sure you're using 0.001, because we did find out that it when it used to be sort of accepted that like, yeah, you can use it with you know 001 or 01, but it turns out the 01 does give you inflated false positives. And in some, some other work, we showed why that happened and it has to do with the, the type of smoothness and long range dependency. But I think that's very well communicated here. It was actually back in the day, it was uh, FSL that was using a default of 0.01. FSL SPM has always used 001 as a default. Uh, threshold. Okay, so I, I don't have time to actually go into it, but just to say that there are ways of, of making the same inferences with fewer assumptions if you use a permutation approach. Basically, in short, instead of using theory, you can actually use the data itself to um, uh, basically estimate the, 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 the appropriate threshold, and it ends up being a bit more sensitive. Um, and for example, instead of getting five voxels, you can get 58 voxels. Um, and that's something that's been an SPM extension for, for ages. And there are also some uh, elaborations you can do, including something called variance smoothing, which if you have fewer than 20 subjects, uh, unfortunately, if that is the case, uh, you can get some additional sensitivity from that. Okay, so now the other way of measuring false positives. Again, there's no one unique way of measuring false positive risks as soon as you're looking at more than one test. So the other way of measuring them is the false discovery rate. So the false discovery rate uh, comes from sort of a cross tabulation of all the different things that can go wrong in your image. If you're just using the threshold, you can have some sort of true effects where the, the null is false and some true nulls. And of course, for each of those, you can either have the result being below threshold or above threshold. The false discovery rate is basically saying, well, wouldn't it be great if we could just sort of think about this ratio, the ratio of false positives to the total number of positives. So no longer a probability. Family-wise error is the probability of any false positives. This is saying, no, no let's think about the ratio. Now, the problem is you don't know for any one result how many of your significant voxels are false positives. But we can try to control the expected false discovery, the, the expected realized false discovery. Let's make this concrete with an illustration. So these are your next 10 experiments, and things are going great. They're actually not null experiments. They have a nice, strong signal in the center. So here's the illustration of the noise plus signal, bring us a signal plus noise image. And uh, now let's think about different ways of thresholding this. So we could threshold this with no correction for multiple comparisons. And just for illustration, I'll use an uncorrected alpha equals 0.1, or 10% threshold. And we are doing a great job across these 10 experiments of recovering the signal, but we're also getting a lot of noise. How much noise? Well, I've tabulated it here. Outside of the significant area, the outside of where the signal is, marked by the red, we have 11.3% of the voxels, 11.3, 12.5, 10, 10. Now, is it always exactly 10%? No, there's variation. But on average, a valid statistical procedure is guaranteeing that on average, no more of the null voxels, no more than 10% of the null voxels will come up as false positives. And that's something that we're guaranteed in the long run, not on any one particular statistical map, but obviously that's not exact, right? There's too many false positives here. So we could instead say, no, let's try to control the family-wise error rate. And we can do that. I could use random field theory or I could use Mark Peroni. Um, and what's happening here is I'm illustrating sort of the next 10 experiments, but this time, only one, one out of 10 experiments. So I'm illustrating here a 10% false positive rate. One out of 10 false positives, uh, one out of 10 experiments had any false positives. So if you can see them here, there's two voxels, but this comprises a family-wise error. So the false discovery rate is trying to come make some compromise between these two. So it is finding the threshold such that 
no more than 10% on average of what you see are false positives. Now, is it exactly 10% each time you use this procedure? No. So here it was 6.7, here is 10.4, here 4.1, it varies. But in the long run, you're guaranteed that on average, the proportion of false positives among the detections is no more than the nominal rate. So that's what these, how these three different methods uh, compare and how family, in particular, how family-wise they're false. Uh, there is no fancy mathematics, <laughs> amazingly, well, there's proof behind it, but actually the way, if you wanted to compute the benjamin hochberg yourself, you could do it actually even graphically. Uh, you actually just order the p-values from smallest to largest, and uh, the, the value, the, p, the largest p-value that is that is below this line that, that satisfies this inequality is uh, becomes your threshold. So it's, it's actually quite easy. Uh, and what that means though, so it's, is, and this is what can be confusing to people, is that the FDR procedure is adaptive. So if you give it another statistic image that's different, you're going to get a different threshold. It depends on the amount of signal in the image. And here's a little toy illustration of this. So it turns out that p-values under the null hypothesis are uniformly distributed. So they're spread from zero to one. So if you order them from smallest to largest, on average, they'll be on the diagonal. Of course, they, they, they wave around the diagonal, but for illustration purposes, they're putting them exactly in half. Now, let's imagine the case where one, two, three, or four or more of the voxels become significant. How significant? Well, the p-values are basically exactly the same. Well, what was the threshold that was used to decide whether this one here would be significant or not? Well, alpha over v. That's part of the adaptive threshold. Well, that, that's actually just like Bob Peroni. But what happens if I actually have more and more voxels that are actually significant? The remaining null ones, of course, are spread uniformly between zero and one. Oh, look, that last last one. So it actually has a threshold of alpha. And you might say, well, that's insane. I have a multiple testing problem. But actually, if you have a 100,000 voxel image and you knew somehow by an oracle that nine 199,999 of those voxels have a true effect, and there was only one null voxel, you only have one location in the brain where you have a risk of making a false positive, and you no longer have a multiple testing problem. So this is the amazing thing that FDR is doing, is adaptively using the most conservative threshold you can have, Alfaroni, to absolutely no correction, depending on the strength of the signal in the data. So it's, it's pretty, pretty uh, amazing. So if we apply the FTR procedure to the, the same data set as before, we get the same regions, the same terra cingulate, the thalamus, but we also pick up some viable regions, uh, and perhaps some other, other regions, and uh, certainly more, more voxels. Now, again, you might say, well, which do I want? <laughs> do I want this result or do I want this result? Well, of course you want this result, but of course it's apples and oranges, really. There are false positives in this image, surely. Whereas here, we have a statement of saying we're 95% confident that there are no false positives in this image. Here we're saying, on average, now I cannot say, I would love to say that there are exactly 5% of all these 3,073 voxels are false positives. I cannot say that. I can simply say that upon repetitions of this procedure over and over again, among all of the things that are declared significant, no more than 5% uh, will be declared as, uh, uh, will, will be false positives in the long run. That's all we can say, but that's generally what we get with, from statistical procedures otherwise. So uh, it, it increased power, of course, and decreased specificity. Uh, just for some historical uh, uh, perspective in SPM, uh, SPM before SPM8 uh, was actually uh, only a voxel-wise FTR. And with SPM8, there was an introduction so that FTR was now available for both clusters and peaks. And actually, the voxelwise FDR was disabled. So if you wanted that, you actually have to, if you want voxelwise FDR, you have to go into the defaults file and, and change default stats to hardware FDR to zero. Um, so basically, to say that that there are reasonable procedures, I just find that the, the, the voxelwise application of FDR seems to be much more impactful. You get much more, uh, greater power advantages over uh, family wise, era voxel wise uh, compared to family-wise or cluster-wise FDR. And the other thing that's a little bit, you just have to get used to is that with the, whether it's cluster-wise FDR or peak-wise FDR, the number of peaks or the number of clusters depends on your cluster-forming threshold. 
And so that's something you have to uh, realize is that the, the, the FDR results will change and be dependent on the cluster forming threshold that you're using. Okay, uh, and I think I'll just skip through this. This is just an illustration of showing you that uh, that the, with FDR, there is a sort of a, um, uh, with voxel level uh, FWE, there is a real uh, advantage. Oh, sorry. Ah! Uh, it, it, illustrating that with uh, voxel-wise uh, FDR, you get a real power gain, whereas I feel like with cluster-wise uh, FDR, you're not gaining that much power over uh, the, the FWE result. And that's illustrated here. So dramatic difference between voxel FWE and voxel FDR, whereas not that much difference between cluster FWE um, at these two different cluster coefficients. Okay, so I'll think I'll, I'll stop there. So the main take home here is that there are many different uh, there are different ways of assessing signals image in images, but no matter how you assess the signal, you have to account for the multiplicity. Uh, otherwise, you just can't trust the results you have. There are two different ways to measure false positive risk in the multiple testing setting, family-wise error rate, and false discovery rate. Family-wise error is the most specific and sort of most uh, sort of inferentially powerful, but may not be the most statistically powerful. So, so it's very specific, but not very sensitive, perhaps. In false discovery rate is um, voxel-wise, is uh, I think in a voxel-wise setting has a lot to, to offer and maybe slightly less so in the cluster-wise uh, and peak-wise. All right, I'll stop there.